<laughs> Welcome everyone to the Co-Creators Convergence third Thursday conversation. I'm Noelle Marshall and um, together with my husband, uh, my beloved Bob Warner, who's off camera now. Oh, there he is. We call ourselves Light Partners, L-I-G-H-T. I have to explain that a lot. Uh, and together we call ourselves, um, we're stewards of the Co-Creators Convergence. So uh, our light partner, that's just us, hosts these calls every Thursday night. And we're real excited. Uh, every week we have a wonderful conversationalist. And uh, what I want to do is there are some folks that are new to our group. So before we begin, I'm going to do a little screen share and tell you a little bit about the Co-Creators Convergence before we, before we introduce our very exciting guest. So Peter Panagor. So hold on one moment. So that is a little bit about us. Right now, what I want to do is turn it over to my good friend, Kathy Mason, who will be introducing Peter Pandagore. Kathy Mason is really, she is one of the major in engines behind the co-creators convergence because she's always bringing us such wonderful guests. And so we're very grateful for that. And, uh, and she has a really cute uh, laugh too. So I always like to hang out with Kathy because she's a high vibrational being and she brings us some wonderful high vibrational beings. Okay, well, thank you, Noelle and Bob. And I hope everyone got to see the, in the video introduction that we, there's several ways to be a member of Co-Creators Co Convergence. You can be a member on Facebook, which is a wonderful, Facebook group that we have. It's CCC Co Creators Convergence, is the name of the group. And also, we do, we couldn't meet in person in, in a large group last year, but we are meeting um, in 2022 again. So, so want to make sure everyone gets a chance to go and find out about that, as well as these conversations. So what I'd like to do is, um, I'm very, very excited about having Peter here. I'll introduce you to Peter and then I'll do an opening um, centering so that we'll all be able to leave our day behind and, and get present here. And um, what I wanted to make sure that everyone knows, I'm a huge fan of Peter Panagor. Um, not only, <laughs> um, I, I have to say he is the most articulate person I know about mystical experiences. And he's, he brings in almost a poetic expression so that others can understand and follow and have their own experience. Peter has written many books and we'll be talking about that. His topic tonight is near-death experience mysticism and the world. And I think you will be so impressed with his expression of mysticism and, and how it might actually level up your high vibes as well. So hi, Peter, you're, you're still, you're still um, muted. So, okay, okay, then I'll do this first and then we'll go, okay? <laughs> 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the word God. So I hope everybody's okay with that on this. Um, it's okay. Um, this is powerful suggestions to summon divine assistance. And I think during this time period, it's a wonderful expression. Thank you, God, for your perfect guidance, unconditional love, and ongoing support. If it is in the highest good for me and for all life everywhere, please divinely orchestrate the following in just the perfect time. Inspire me to feel grateful for what is and excited about what is to come. Allow me to awaken fully refreshed each morning with joy and gratitude in my heart. Help me to release and let go of anything that no longer serves me in a positive way. Help me release all emotional blocks, toxic thoughts, and self-sabotaging behavior. Make it easy for me to transform every challenge into a valuable opportunity. Inspire me to love myself unconditionally so I can love others in the same way. Help me to stay fully connected with my divine source of life force energy. Reveal your grandest plan in ways that I can easily see and understand. Continue to remind me that I'm worthy of health, happiness, and prosperity. Inspire me to see the beauty and benefits in all people in all situations. Inspire me to demonstrate impeccable integrity in all that I say and do. Provide whatever I need to demonstrate my highest purpose for being. Show me ways to do what I love and to love what I do for a living. Inspire me to see the magnificence in even the smallest of things. Allow me to perceive life through the eyes of awe and wonder. Help me to be the positive change that I want to see in the world. And with that, I hope that brought you comfort and uh, something to think about. And with that, I'm very excited to talk with Peter again. Yay. So Peter, I realize it's been three months since I've talked to you. Shame, shame, shame. We should be talking more often. <laughs> um, because I want everyone to um, know that you're a tremendous resource for them. So how would you like to start this? Should I explain or um, mention your books? Or how would you like to? Yeah, let's get the, 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 the superficial stuff done. <laughs> Okay, so and I always giggle with Peter, you have to understand because I, I get it. I get it totally. Okay, so Peter's written three, well, it's almost three books, two books and a movie and almost a third book. The first book's called Two Minutes for God. Show that and tell. Was, excuse me? Show and tell. <laughs> and um the Two Minutes for God is a book that he wrote while he was a minister on TV. He's this is a TV personality we're working with here. Um, and he there, there, you got for 15 years, you got to be a TV reverend, right? Yep. And so there, that's a wonderful compilation of stories, Two Minutes for God. And then his second book, which is, um, and you're going to show them, right? Yay, Heaven is Beautiful. And um, that book is a, a story, which I hope you get to tell a little bit about it, about you as a young man um, dying and while you're mountain climbing and what happened with that. And it, it's amazing. And that book is being made into a film. So pretty soon you'll be able to say you met Peter and he's the the film guy. Anyway, besides being the TV guy. Anyway, okay. And then he is working on a third book, but it's not completed yet. It's Modern Mysticism and You. And that's part of what we get to discuss tonight is part of his journey into 
explaining in such a beautiful and eloquent way about mysticism so it could be usable for all of us. So anything else, Peter, that you'd like me to add? <laughs> oh, no, okay. thanks. It's good. Thanks. Okay. Well, with that, I'm so, so excited to introduce all of you to my friend, Peter Panagor. Oh, you know what I should say is peterpanagor.love. Dot love. Oh, yeah. The website. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Okay. Well, nice to be here again. Thanks for asking me to be here, Kathy. It's always a pleasure talking to you. It's always fun. We do have fun. We do. Um, and so that's really, that makes the, that makes our conversation all the better. So I, I, the book I'm working on, uh, I've, I've actually written most of it and it's changed. Um, it's become um, that it's about modern mysticism and you, but it's, its focus, its focus has shifted a little bit more to storytelling with some uh, reflection. So less, less expository, more storytelling with reflection. And the, the whole, the basis of the whole thing is this is, well, it's a couple things. I, I'm a near-death experiencer and I died ice climbing when I was 21 years old and I went to a place of no thingness into a unitive state of being. And it wrecked my life. I, I chose to come back. It wrecked my life and totally changed me and made me into an, a completely different person. But previous to that, I had been starting as a very young child. I began having a transportive, what people are calling spiritually transformative experiences, which I call mystical experiences because they they left me a changed person every every advanced every minor and every advanced mystical experience reorients the receiver a degree on a compass or 180 degrees yep. it depends on the intensity of the experience but what happens is is that the course the course of your life is changed going forward forevermore so as a child i had a whole series of these things that i i I'll, maybe I'll talk about them tonight, or maybe I won't, depends on how the conversation goes. But subsequent, after my near-death experience, they continued and intensified. And when I came back the first time from dying, my I was lost. And so I dove into my centering prayer practice, which is built in Theravada Buddhism and, and Western Christianity. And a, so it's a practice of silence. And into my I learned Kriya practice, and I began practicing Kriya uh, through... Yogananda and the Yoga Sutras primarily. So all of that led me to a, a life of contemplation. And I, I worked, I, I got ordained, I went to divinity school, I studied mysticism, got my graduate degree in mysticism. And uh, because I was a lost person on the interior, living alone I, in isolation, my interior world was, was vastly separated from my exterior world, except for I, I was sort of like an, an avatar living inside of a body, looking down from the upside through a set of eyes into the world where I knew I wasn't really part of and masking, pretending I was like everybody else. But the problem was, of course, everybody knew I was weird. So they just didn't know why I was, why I did the things I did and why I said the things I did. They, I just never told them because I was afraid to lose credibility. So all of that is to say is that it, it, it led me into a study of a lifelong study of mysticism. So after my, my degree, I continued to work and to study and, and privately, but I, I was a church pastor. And so I worked in the context of a church community. I got ordained. I, I need to say right here and now that I am not a religious person and I am not a believer. I am not a person of faith. I, and that's not just about religion. It's about culture and politics and everything else. It's not that I don't have interests in them and, and, uh, and uh, pay attention. It's, it's that I see that they're all impermanent. I see that they're all constructs of the human mind, and they're not actually either material like my glasses. They're not made out of something that is, you know, you can put your finger on, uh, but they're made out of ideas. And ideas play a huge part of the way mysticism works. Mysticism works in the world, I should say. It works through the, through the realm of ideas and not about beliefs. And that's a very big difference. Mysticism is knowledge, not belief. And knowledge comes from direct experience. So after my, I, had, I did have the, had this TV show for 15 years, TV, AM and FM, and I was the fifth minister. I got recruited into this and I was the fifth minister. It was when it finally closed. It was the oldest and longest running religious broadcast, drum roll, on earth. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
it started, I know it's crazy. It started in, uh, it started in 1926. And so I was on television every single day, seven days a week, 365 for 15 years. And I had two minutes every morning to tell an inspirational story. And so it, during that time, I was trying to figure out how to come out of the closet as a mystic, as a near-death experiencer. And so I began poking around, li not live on TV, but recorded on TV in my stories, which could have been anything about, you know, cosmology to dust bunnies, but always about love. I only had one subject, it was always love, but approached in a million different ways. And, and so I began to poke around about it. And then I ended up working with this group out of New York City, and they talked me into writing my first book, my second book rather, on near death experience. And when that all ended, okay, my the new a new group bought the TV station after 91 years, we got phased out, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I started booking churches like Lee's churches, Lee who's here tonight, around New England to talk on Sunday morning. I was looking for a gig, you know, I got to keep the flow of the cash, and and also I I, I was known as a mystical out of the closet near-death experiencer. And so in the pulpit, I began to ask pretty recent, uh, pretty soon after I began this 18-month uh, tour around New England and all these different uh, churches, ask, raise your hand, just before my sermon, raise your hand if you've ever had a visitation from the dead. And nobody would raise their hand. And then I'd raise my hand and half the congregation in every single church, 50% in every single church, raised their hands. Every Like half the church. And everybody's like, you did? You did? And it was really obvious nobody talked about it. And so I asked, who here's ever told anybody? And everybody had told somebody. So everybody knew somebody. If they didn't have it themselves, they knew somebody who did. And, and then I said, who's ever talked about it in church? Nobody had. Nobody had talked about... A, a, a life-changing, spiritually transformative experience because it was taboo, because they were afraid, because the church talked against it, because, because you don't bring it up at a cocktail party, you don't talk about it in the subway, you know, you don't talk about this thing because it's woo-woo. So all of this was in the milieu. And, and then I remembered, I remembered uh, this book here, Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. And William James is one of the most brilliant Americans who's ever lived. And that's not just my opinion. That is like true. Uh, and in this book, Varieties, he's, he's got this chapter on mysticism where he des describes the four characteristics of mystical experience. So the, they're, they're, and I don't have them in order, according to his order. They're uh, transient. They have a beginning and an end. They start and they finish. They're passive. They happen to you. You don't make them happen. That's what happened to me every time. I'm, I'm like a rag doll in its presence. It's noetic. It leaves a wisdom in your soul that's ineffable. That's the fourth one. You can't say it. And so what happens in an after-death communication, and if you probably somebody here has one, I just had my dad just came back to me two weeks ago. My dad passed away recently and um, he, he came to me. So in, in, in these kind of experiences, what often happens, and it can be in a dream state, can be in a waking state, the deceased loved one, and so you're in grief, person is grieving, the deceased loved one comes in a dream and telepathically communicates directly love or forgiveness or mercy or whatever, you know, understanding or our well-being or something, but always it's love. There's always love inside of this. And it's like this, this rush of data that come in, comes into us in a, in a block form. It's not, it's not downloaded in a stream. It's like a block, right? And then it, then it, it continues to flow as long as you're, you're in contact with this person. And then they go away. And then what happens to the grieving person is, is that their grief shifts. And this is like a gift from heaven. It is a gift from heaven because now this receiver knows that their deceased loved one is not really dead. And they might not know that about themselves, that there's a heaven waiting for them or that anybody else is in heaven. It doesn't really matter because this one thing shows them the truth that they can have hope. They can have hope for the rest of their lives. They can continue to love this person, even in their grief and, and grief is the, like the twin of love or the um, unexpressed love, the, the love that you can't give to where you want it to go, except for in your tears, you can. 
because it, love is grief. And, and it maintains this connection to the other side and these, that the deep grief because of the, the knowledge that their deceased loved one lives, the, the connection to the other side with hope um, and communication can intensify. So there's this real understanding uh, that it has nothing to do with belief. Nobody, and, and when you try to tell somebody, oh, my brother came to visit me and he communicated to me the beauty of heaven and that all is well and that he's an eternal being. What does that mean to somebody who's not experienced that? Nothing. And so the, so the language of it falls flat on its face. It becomes much smaller when you try to talk about it. You can't ever convey the depth of the, of the understanding that is blocked down, block loaded into you. And that's a mystical experience. That's a, a real mystical experience. Half the population, according to Marjorie Woolacott at the IANS conference this year, and her paper, 45% of those surveyed had an after-death communication like this. So that's a huge population. Now in churches, the churches I, un I uh, unscientifically surveyed, uh, that was 50%, but you know, churches would skew. I would think that churches and synagogues and mosques, they would skew toward you know, people who have had these experiences who are raised in the context of their culture and their community, um, trying to find expression of it in the church, but never really, never be able to talk about it because it has no expression in church. Um, so I, I came to the conclusion that lots of people were actually mystics. Many more people had mystical experiences than ever were talked about in public. And that there was this big, big, everybody knows secret that nobody talks about. And I started thinking about it like domestic violence. I worked, I worked in domestic violence for a long time in lots of different capacities. And one of the things that protected domestic abusers before 1970, when a book was written, uh, was the silence of the community. Everybody knew somebody was being abused, but nobody would talk about it. And that, that, that changed, uh, fortunately. It hasn't ended domestic violence. But it, nobody, we talk about it now. I can talk about it here. Um, that needs to happen to mysticism. It needs to come out of the closet because we need to normalize it in conversation like this, which is private and, but it's, I mean, it's also public, isn't it? It's being streamed, right? So, uh, and I'm happy to talk about it because I'm a natural modern mystic. I, I began having mystical experiences as a kid and they've continued right through my life. And um, when I came out with uh, my near-death experience book, I came out knowing it was a cloak, I, was, I got very good at masking. So I masked my near-death experience. I, I learned how to put up, uh, put up uh, illusions so that I, I could protect my, my true self, uh, this light. I wore, a, a, you know, in Jesus' language, a bushel, a bushel basket over my, you know, over my lamp or however you want to put it. Um, I definitely have lived most of my life like that until, the, until recently, the past few years. But um, once I came out of the closet, uh, as a near-death experiencer, that was sort of prep work. Because I figured if I could come out as a near-death experiencer, and near-death experience, as it turns out, is also a mystical experience that fits into the categories uh, that William James described. It's not, it, it may be a high-level one, by, be judged by the after effects and the radical changes, and, but there are also levels of near-death experience. Some people pop out on a street corner after a car wreck and get right back in, totally changed forever, but never really went uh, very far into uh, the afterlife. But they went far enough to know that their consciousness is separate from their body. And so there's all these people walking around and so who are mystics, who are, on, out, who are not in the, uh, out in the public. And now imagine this, that, that my little New England, imagine that's all over the world. If there's 45% of the people surveyed, why wouldn't that be true everywhere on the planet in every single religion or non-religion that people are having visitations from the dead and nobody's talking about it because it's taboo everywhere. Uh, it's crazy. So I decided that if I could come out as a near-death experiencer and, and risk my reputation as a professional um, and sort of decide to after my second near-death experience, I, did, I, had the, I had the strength to do this. Um, maybe then I'd feel safe enough to come out as a mystic. Because, you know, there are, Pim von Lomel talked about, he's a, he's a researcher at IANS or with IANS, oh. somewhere like 10 or 20 million Americans oh. with after-death, uh, near-death experience. And, I think uh, 
up. Oh, somebody's got and their mic on. Sorry to say. You can have that. I'm so, gonna mute. There we go. So, um, so. 10 to 20 million Americans have had a near-death experience to extrapolate that across the world. Because for the last, since 1960s, we've been using cardiac care. And I'm, a, I, you know, my second near-death experience was a cardiac event. Um, and we've been pulling the dead back for 60 years. There's tens of millions of us in every country. Yeah. Or, or you know, depending on the size of the country, like uh, I'm sure that the Vatican, which is a country, you know, has its proportional share, um, the smaller, the larger and all that stuff. But as we begin to talk around the world, as we begin to network, as we have, because we have social media, because we have the web, because we have YouTube, because we have Facebook, we're networking around the world. There are Facebook groups of near-death experiences uh, with 80,000 people in it. And most of those people probably aren't NDEers, but lots of them are. So we're seeing near-death experiencers who are writing books and making videos and having conversations are raising the cultural consciousness of this phenomenon. And because we are, as my Christian friends would say, convicted, I am convicted. You can't, nobody can change my mind about this because I am, you know, I don't know, it's real for me. Um, so I don't, it's, I, I don't, I, I, once I, once I realized that I can just talk about it, I wanted every near-death experiencer to have the opportunity to have a voice because the more of us who talk about it, the more it becomes normalized in every context uh, from the surgery to uh, the street sweeper, everybody it's indiscriminate, right? And it's global in every single country. There are tens of millions of these individual light points living inside people in their hearts where they're, they're expressing this, even if they don't use, they don't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone for 20 years. It didn't mean it wasn't spilling off of me the whole time. It was spilling off of me the whole time. And that's kind of the way it goes. So as this movement grows, and it's been growing for the last um, 40 years, 40 years yeah. we're going to open up the door to a much larger group. And the larger group are all the other people in the world who've had mystical experiences who can't talk about them. Now, imagine if 50% if of any nation or population would just begin to talk about this, what kind of nudge we could have in, the, in, the, in this rapidly changing global series of real serious crises that we're having. I, the climate change thing, th this, is catacly this, this is cataclysmic for, for nation states and famines and droughts. And maybe it's not my lifetime when that happens, but my kids, my grandkids. And so this is a, the way I see this is that there's a, there's a, the great global awakening, you know, everybody's been talking about it since Paul, right? Um, but it, Paul got it completely wrong and nobody had any idea that this is science was going to conspire with God to raise the dead, to make an army of mystical light bringers around the world. Who, who would have guessed that? <laughs> nobody would have guessed that. And um, so long-term project, the more individual people who can become channels of light into themselves by turning inward to find personal healing in the light without uh, non-egoistic selfless healing the more of us there are and and the more it multiplies because there's this incredible thing that i've only experienced in two places primarily in two places in my life one is at the ians conferences where all of these NDEs show up and everybody's got their radiant bubble their aura their halo whatever you want to call it and it and it so when two of get together, it's like three people are there. So it's this multiplying factor. I felt it in at St. Joseph's Abbey and St. Benedict's Abbey in Massachusetts and Colorado, where the Trappist monks practice centering prayer and 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 uh, divin, do, dove in deep into uh, the the non being of the divine. Um, and where people are interiorly connected in a way that has nothing or little to do with their egos is then it makes itself available on the exterior just by its own beingness. And, and when I'm in, a, in the company of someone who uh, has a capacity 
they can see, then I can see them and they can see me. And the more that I can see them and they can see me, the greater the strength is among us and between us. But, but really what's going on is that I'm not really seeing them at all. It's the light seeing itself. Because as I step out of the way of, of, the, of my root connection to the unspeakable, ineffable love, the more that speaks for me and through me. And the bigger my ear becomes, my ear of my soul becomes, the eye of my soul, the, the, the touch of my soul, feel it, see it, hear it, live it. And the more that I do that inside myself, the more it reaches to another person. And the more that other person does it, the more it reaches to me. And so it's this geometrically expanding thing. So I, I actually am, I know that we're, as a planet, we've, we've created a mess uh, and it's going to be lots of trouble. But for the first time in the history of the world, this is really something new. There's never been, mystics have never been a united force. We're, we're all individual and we're all individualistic. I'm not going to be joining any group. I, I, I run a channel and I have a, I, I have, I have conversation group a salon on Sunday morning. But, but why, the reason why it works is because every mystic that comes there has the humility that's born out of their experience and the connection to the divine. And they understand the, the portion of the gift of understanding that they've got, and they're willing to share it with equanimity. And so there's this, um, it's not only, mysticism is not only about the radiance that is shared between people. It's, it's, it comes with all these other things like kindness and, and, humility and love and beauty and joy. And it's not perfection. It's not like, um, like someone said to me this week, you don't seem like a reverend. <laughs> um, like, thanks. I don't think I do. I don't want to. Um, but it has nothing to do with any of those affects. It has to do with, with actually the deeper in one travels and in the interior of oneself, the truer one becomes who one is, the more one becomes who one is, the more light pours through, and then it's no effort to be nice. Then it's no effort to be kind. And you can still be strong and, and, and supportive, and you can be defensive as you need to be. It doesn't eliminate your ego. It doesn't eliminate um, practicality in the world. It just brings light wherever you go. So that, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, well, one of the things I wanted to add um, is that when I met you the first time, I think was in Colorado at the IONS event. I, I and remember. you even were on TV that time, I think, um, <laughs> while we were there. I but was. What, what I felt, um, I haven't had a near-death experience that I know of, but I've had a spiritually transformative experience. And when I came into that group of 500 people, I could feel like I was at home. These people, when they've had these transformational experiences, it's a feeling. They are more aware of their Godhead and their origin, and they're bringing more of that into this dimension where in the past, people taught, religions talked about you died and went to heaven. You had that that experience after you left your body, I believe that this whole game we're in right now is to bring as much as possible into physical and change the world from that. Because as you said, the people resonate at a different level. They're more authentic. They may be confused because just like me, I didn't have words. That's why I love listening to you, Peter, because I didn't have words. And you give me words because I can read poetry, I can read Rumi, and I get the feeling, but those aren't usable words for me to describe or to try to relate to someone else. They feel me, but they they we need to have this and this in order to help people evolve, I think. Oh, I, I think so, because they need knowledge. Knowledge doesn't lead to the divine, but knowledge helps you understand it in the world. Right, right. And, and you got to, if you're living in the world, that's super helpful. Right. I, think you, I think you're right. Uh, I think that that's what Jesus was tr actually trying to teach. I'm sure that that's what Rumi was doing in his dancing, is that they were becoming channels of heaven here. 
You know, Jesus was talking about um, heaven realized and heaven uh, and uh, far away. I can't remember. Lee might have to bring me back to the theological terms that are blank, I'm blanking on right now, but heaven right here where we are and heaven in the beyond. It, it, it's not this thing. It is this thing that you go to. But the weird thing is, once I'd been there, even though I don't have anywhere near the intensity of the experience here, it's still with me. It didn't go away. Right. As a matter of fact, it dogged me like like a snapping wolf until I, I turned around to begin to feed it. And once I began to feed it, it became my friend, uh, still wild. But um, and, and then it, you know, its presence, the self-emptying process, which is what contemplation is, you spend time, 20 minutes a day, half an hour a day in uh, aiming towards silencing the the running mind, the ego, the the monkey mind, to enter into the pa- the place of peace. And what you're actually doing is you're opening up your door into heaven. You're polishing your inner lens because you're eliminating the one thing that's in in your way. The only thing between me and God is me, and I'm the one. If I can if I can quiet myself down and learn to create peace inside myself and create a cavity of peace inside myself, the bigger my cavity becomes, the more access I have to become heaven here now. And then it, it's not, it's not, it's not just air, airy fairy. It's, it's, it, it permeates my life. It changes things around me. It changes my interactions with people, but also it, I walk out and maybe you've had this experience. I'm sure you've had this experience. You're out in nature and you're out in this incredibly beautiful place. And suddenly you feel like this, like spirit is all around you and in you. And it's because it is. (laughs) And, and that sort of thing, that feeling of heaven all around you can be all the time. Yes. And because it's living inside you and then it, it sort of penetrates it, it sort of extends my vision outside myself of the same thing I'm seeing inside myself. And it's, it, it, I don't want to say magical because it's totally ordinary in terms of it's, it's part of reality. I and mean, it's like always here, always now. All we have to do is get out of the way to let it be the leader in our lives. Um, okay, anyway. so I have a question I've sure. never asked you. Um, so um, I know that every single day I wake up and remember my, my spiritually transformative experience and start from there in connection. You've mm-hmm. had two near-death experiences. Did you have a different connection on the first one to the second one? Oh, yeah. And I, I, I should let you know, and I probably haven't talked about this, Kathy, but when I was five and then when I was six, and then I was in high school, and then I was in college. I had a I had a series of mystical experiences that each one of them left me a different person. Subsequent, like if you go, like if you go to my Facebook page right now, I've got my dad just passed away. I've got this. I think I'm six years old, and I'm wearing a bow tie. Yeah. Okay. My whole family we all wear, we all wear bow ties because my dad. And that's after someone said to me, "Your eyes are the same." And, and I, I know because that's after my first and my second mystical experience where, where I had already been touched into the divine. And every, so every time a mystical experience is like a born again experience, Christians say you get born again. Yeah, well, I've been born again. I don't know how many times I could count them up. Near death experience were big rebirths, but there's a, every single mystical experience that, that leaves you a spiritually transformative experience that leaves you reoriented. You're a new person. Right. You're, you've been remade. And I use, I, I do use my memory of, my connection to those in those places inside myself, which turned out to be one place now over all these years. They're all sort of one place. Um, I aim myself at them in my meditation life. And they, they, they are gifts that open as a doorway, every single one of them. And so if you look, like you say, you get up in the morning and you lens your prayer life through your spiritually transformative experience, that is a, uh, your doorway to heaven. That's everybody's doorway to heaven, whatever, whatever the experience is. And if you have multiple experiences, um, well, I guess there, there is, I had one a few years ago that opened up one of my chakras that, that allowed, allowed a state of peace inside me to flow through me like a river for six months that, that right through all sorts of real serious tragedies, like in the really, in the midst of deep pain and suffering, that peace just kept flowing. Like it was independent of me. It was like, it was like, 
like a puppeteer, like a like a ventriloquist who's on stage, the in the vent and the puppets doing in something independently. It was like that. I'm over here suffering, and the peaceful thing is still going on, still there. Um, so and it's an oh, go ahead, yeah. How do you feel? So I believe that our soul uh, selected these bodies for us to be here right now, and selected at some level um obstacles or learning or if this is earth school and how do you how do you um correlate that with your mystical experiences um the first time i died and i i asked to come back and god said to me you won't live your life i said i choose to my live my life and the and the voice without sounded or you know it's, it's all i it's all metaphor i've added language to something that has no language and so i say uh, uh, i want to go back god says you can go back i want you to stay but you can go back i say well i, I i'm going back and god said i am going to live my life and god says you won't live your life and sends me out and as i'm sent out i'm i'm becoming more and more dense as I uh, as I travel back, and in front of me are um, a million different entry points, like little tiny caves, like little ends of, of fiber optic cables, and all of them are entry points that funnel into my my body. And so, but they're all different lives to live. And at the very core of the of this large group of these uh, of these openings is a single, very wide, large single beam of white light. And I know because I can hear the voice saying, pick the light, but you must choose pick the light. And I'm like, I love the light, but I want some autonomy. And I and so I didn't go right into the laser beam. I went off to the side into the diffused light. And and as I entered in, I saw all of the probabilities of all of the lives. And in particular, I saw all of the probabilities of the life I was going to live. And I saw that that in each choice that I would make inside of these probabilities that would lead me into other of these fiber optic cables. So, and, and they were a million of these cables and they all had a million choices inside of them. And so I could move through all these probabilities. And, and so when I'm back in my body again, I began to experience that as I would, I still do. I live sort of ahead of time. So I, I see what's going to happen a moment before it happens, and I experience it like a memory. And it's a, it's a, a, it's a weird sort of, it was very disorienting in the beginning, um, but I've, I've adjusted to it. And sometimes it waves of intensity and other times it recedes, but it's, it's always there. And so what I, when I enter into it, when I see a situation occur and I see it as a memory, it's because it's not because I did it before in my in my life. It's that it was always a probability, and it became an actuality as a result of the choices that I made. Now, if I had made a different choice, it would be a different actuality. Or if someone around me, who's in their own life stream, makes a different choice, their life pressures on my life in a new way over which I have no control. And another probability becomes an actuality. And the reason why I'm explaining it this way is that it's not a faded path. It's not like, you know, point A to point B and there's, there's you know, this stop and that stop and that stop. It's more, it's more like a, an, a multidimensional uh, train set with, uh, with interstellar travel thrown in. It's like all these probability and possibilities. So all of that said, a second point is that when I was dead, I anything I wanted to know there was no school everything I wanted to know I knew everything I wanted to know I knew it downloaded into me in an instant I, I had I had understanding of infinite nature with a small I not capital I infinity because I was still a limited I, I, I was limited in that I I was not the wholeness of the oneness of being but I was unlimitedness in my disembodied self in the place of no thing. So what I mean is <laughs> all of that taken together, it, I feel stupid here. Okay, this is my stupid world. 
when I was dead, I was super smart. I didn't have a brain in the way of my thinking and have a thick body in the way of my, of my action. Uh, and so did I choose, I, ch I definitely chose the path that I'm living. Did I choose my body? Um, I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me whether, whether I understand. Uh, one, one of the things that I saw on the other side was that the complexity of the universe at large and all of the th all of the motions that are occurring at the same time is, is beyond my sort of ability to at all comprehend and so i stop asking why questions Perfect. why what lesson am i to learn from this I, I i discover the lesson i learned from it as i live through it um and and i don't i don't I don't try to anticipate what I'm supposed to know here because I know where I'm from and I know where I'm going and I'm just trying to, if, the more I pressure myself to the interior, the easier it is to be on the exterior and not worry about what I'm supposed to be learning in this life. Perfect. Um, I hope that all made sense. Yes, yes, it was fantastic. Okay, I got another weird question for you. As far uh, as uh, emotions, um, many people say if you're using manifestation or law of attraction or, or the uh, way to co-create with the universe here in 3D is emotions are the key that whether you're delighted or not delighted. Mysticism seems to not be, well, some of the poetry is um, creates or tries talks about ecstasy, but how do you see mysticism and emotion? Um, when I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I, I have a feeling. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting question that i haven't ever synthesized yet when i came back from the dead my it's like my soul remained in, as one entity of reception so my my uh, it's like i have you ever see the painting of the eyeball on the palm yeah it's like i have eyeballs on my palms i use them all the time because my my what i how i see the light how i hear the light how i feel the light it's all one thing it's not separate things and so I, I, I don't, I know that I have this feelings and I have human emotions. I have anger and, you know, love and all these things. And, um, cause I'm a human being, right? right. But none of them are me, right? This thing is me. So my orientation is secondarily it when, when, I, when I, emotions matter in my human life, but in the depth of my spiritual life, they're made of matter. And they're not me. Okay. And, and so like when you talk about manifesting, uh, part, of, part of a deeper mystical experience is not the intent to create anything in the world. The, the manifestation of a, of a deep mystic is to bring heaven here now, no matter what it is. Not even, not even trying to understand what it is, just getting out of the way and letting this thing exist inside you. And so the co-creation that occurs is heaven itself, not the gifts of heaven. And what happens on a, on a, on a life that's interiorly, interiorly oriented toward the polishing of the lens and the, and the eye wherein I see God, God sees me, into that place is that then all these gifts come as a result. And, and I don't pick the gifts, they just come along. And some of them are like books and some of them are, are like our are people and some of them are are are, are bad events in my life uh the but here's the thing is that in every choice that i'm making in my life good or bad toward this direction or that direction as long as i'm aiming interiorly i'm leaning closer and closer and closer to the light and then because that's all that really matters is my interior orientation to the light and letting the world take care of itself. I, I can't shake this impermanence here. Like I, uh, I, I have a house, I got a car, I got a mortgage, I got all these I got kids and a grandkid and I'm doing all the, you know, finances yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Like I live in the world, but it, but it's illusion to me. I'm, I'm out of here. 
I, I, the impermanence of it, I, I tried to co-create in the world love. That's what I tried to co-create. I tried to bring in peace. I tried to bring in kindness. I tried to bring in these things that aren't things. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Um, I, I just wondered um, if it helped, if emotions help navigate to that, but I, I think you answered that. Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't use that. That's someone, that's for someone else to use. I, 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 I that's not, that's, that may be true, but I don't okay. use that. I use emptiness. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, so then I have another question. Maslow hierarchy of needs. The very top of the pyramid is self-actualization. What, how would you compare your um, concept of mysticism and self-actualization i if if the self that's being actualized is the capital s of of yogic union then it's all good with me but if the self that's being actualized is the egoic self and the self-perception then it's not good with me i see and and so the 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 practice i practice kriya yoga and part of part of deeper yoga is the, the word means union and that is the most like the most mystical word you got unity and union and oneness that's the goal so self actualization is the realization that that you're made of light that i'm made of light that's for me that's what it is because anything that's self actualized in the material world is passing away it's not it's so i i might become mindful in the world and I'm aiming to become mindful. Part of the meditation practice is mindfulness. And mindfulness is a way of being um, actualized in the world to authenticity in, uh, in relationship. But that's, not the, that's still this world here. So for me, self-actualization is actually loss of self. The more I die before I die, the more room there is for the divine inside me. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. So um, I'd love um, I, I'd love to get some questions if the, anyone in the audience has questions, and because I could hog Peter the whole time. Thank you so much. I love, love, love talking with you. I um, while we're waiting for some questions to fulfill, could you because um, you glossed over a little bit about the awakening of humanity and how I, I wanted um, you to punctuate, if you could, or emphasize or underline um, the good news that there, there is a possibility that humanity will wake up to higher oh, consciousness yeah. because of, do you, could you repeat that? Because you kind of glossed over it, but I, I'm so excited. Sure. <laughs> um, and, and I see uh, Dr. Janet's got her hand up. I'll come back to you in a sec there, Doc. Okay. Um, the, so there's this, this tens of millions of mystical experiencers who are basically created by science because they've been brought back from the dead, resuscitated is what the medical field calls it. And we all come back with this interior light that we can't shake. And we're all over the world in every single country. And even if we're not talking about it, it's we're, we're living this experience. And so there's like a little tiny node of light inside of each one of us, or, or a big, a big lamp in some people. And it, it's independent of religion, it's independent of politics, it's independent of nationhood or culture, it is, its source is the divine. And so there's, a, there's like an extra juice going on now. There are, and some of that extra juice is because a near-death experience is different than other kinds of mystical experiences, is, is that when you're dead, there's no silver cord attaching you to your body, you're severed. And it's a radical thing. And maybe you've spent your life in meditation and you've had a, 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 an awakening, but it's been this slow transformative thing, or maybe even a per person of faith, or maybe you love somebody and you get a visitation from the dead. Those all seem to have some sort of cohesiveness to them. But a near-death experience is this radical shift. You're like, one minute you're alive, next minute you're dead, you're in the presence of God, now you're back on earth and you're like, what? <laughs> shattering, totally shattering. And so it, it leaves all of us independent of each other which is the way it ought to be, but it also leaves us all in union with each other, which is the way it is. And because there are so many of us, and because we're all speaking up now, 
because we're communicating with you, with each other, not just here, but like trans, we're we're telepathically communicating with the radiance of the divine between us. Mm -hmm. And the more that we do that, the brighter the whole planet gets. But it also empowers people around us because it's you know two or three are gathered, three or four are there. Um, so the the more of us that practice together or reach out to each other, the larger the bubble of light becomes. And, and then there's all these other people who were naturally born mystics, 50% of the population who've had mystical experiences. We have an opportunity for the first time in the history of the world to actually make spirituality, make real spirituality based not in religion, but in spiritually transformative experiences, a policy, like, like influencing policy, like, like making economic decisions, like making, like, it, it could have practical impact. Um, and it, because it's generals and admirals and, and, and people in the Marines and people who are doctors and nurses and teachers and everybody in the world, lots of us have had these experiences. Yeah. And, and so my hope for the world is that the more of us that speak and we raise our voices to each other, the more people will eavesdrop on our conversations and then join in the conversations, the bigger the opportunity becomes for a, a global talk about spirituality. But not only does it talk about spirituality, it actually brings it into social acceptability. And when it, once it's in social acceptability, then it's in this place of, that it, it can nudge school committees. It can, it can move uh, decisions, uh, shipping decisions. Uh, all, it, it, its impact could be in a thousand different places because we are everywhere, because we're the ones who now know that we're not alone. Like I, I was talking to this guy this week and he's, he's been interviewing it at these really big name places. He's, he's a high flute and smarty pants. Yeah, Amazon and, and Twitter and uh, um, uh, with these two new car companies and this other company and this third company. And, and then he was talking about this electric company that makes scooters. And, and when he was talking about it, his face lit up. And I said, so, you know, face didn't light up when you're talking about Amazon. What's going on? And he said, uh, it's something about the culture there. I think that there are people of light there. Perfect. And, and, and I think that the more of us that join together, the more we have in, in our corporations, in our towns, in our communities, the more we have an opportunity to practically nudge the world. Because spirituality, it's not all out there. It's not all manifesting for you know, our desires. It's actually practically living in the real world as a, as a community. And for a hunt for 200,000 years, Homo sapiens, for longer than that, but for 200,000 years, Homo sapiens have been tribal. And now we have filled the planet and we're, we're bumping shoulders and languages and cultures. And there's nothing else that's going to unify us. There's the, the only thing that's going to unify us is love. And I think we have a chance to do this. And it might take 50 years, might take 100 years. I don't know how long it's going to take. It doesn't really matter. Because, the, because science is going to continue to advance. Is, should we survive as a planet? Um, and bring back more people from the dead. The more dead people come <laughs> back from the dead, this thing is just perpetuates. It's, it's just going to perpetuate. Well, it, it's perfect to uh, talk about this in Co-Creators Convergence, which was is, is, um, originally started to, to bring together a bunch of Barbara Marks Hubbard enthusiasts and teachings. And her whole um, philosophy was that uh, after 2012, there was going to be an evolution of our species called Womo Universalis, which is the what we're talking about. Basically. No kidding. It's, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right on. Well, yeah. it's happening. Always, always. You always are. Okay. So I'm going to let Janet, um, Dr. Janet, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And if you want to show your video, great. There you go. <laughs> Welcome. So, Peter, thank you very much. Um, boy, I could identify with so much of what you were talking about. I'd, I had my first mystical experience about 55 years ago, and I had had experience after experience after experience of sudden consciousness shifts is the best way I can describe it, use words to point to it. But 
at this point, I've become a word energy alchemist. And if you think of Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared, our words are on the right side. This is the way I see it. Our words are on the right side of that equation. But when we're connected with uh, what I call a living, breathing energy, you can use the word God, Allah, the Tao, uh, lots of different things. When you're connected with that, um, you are in the moment who you are. And any words that you use are, as the Buddhists say, only fingers pointing at the moon. But however, I pay a lot of attention to words. So you were born into a male body. I was born into a female body. And I noticed some of the words you were using, which seemed to me to be very masculine. So I'd just be interested. Yeah, which is fine. But I'd be interested in your comments about them or whether you've ever thought about them. For example, you use a phrase, something like, it was, it was raised something, it was either raised consciousness or raised awareness. I don't recall what it was, but have you ever considered expanding consciousness or awareness as opposed expanding to- Expanding consciousness or awareness? I, that's as, like the purpose of my whole being. That's what I do all the time. Right, but the word you used was raise, which to me is a very patriarchal male oh, word. Oh, I, 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 I think- I hear what you're saying. Uh, uh, language is my is my it's my toolbox. Vocabulary is my toolbox. I'm always expanding my language. I'm always searching for words. I, I never figured "raise" being a patriarchal word. I can see where its relationship is to the penis, and I, um, you know, I'm I when I was I could say this much is when I was dead, I had no gender, and. And God had no gender. God had no being. God is not even the word I would use. Tao is a great word. Um, my primary audience are, are expat Christians who are escaping fundamentalism or liberal, or, or liberal lack of spirituality. And so the language structure that I've studied for most of my life is all uh, with the understanding that I keep pointing out patriarchal language where I see it. I don't always see it because I'm a man. And um, <laughs> you see, I, so I got a different perspective on this. I know it's totally great. Well, that's why I read yeah. women writers because women have a different perspective. It's great. Um, and uh, I should say that I, I have an English degree. And, and so when I was an undergraduate, most of the people we read were men. I didn't pick the books that the professors did. Um, you know, so I read a lot of women. Um, but anyway, so no, I don't know. Uh, I'm always looking for language. I'm always looking. I read a lot of Rumi. I read a lot of Kafir, a lot of Hafez, a lot of Lao Tzu. Um, and I'm always picking into putting it in my brain. What would you suggest instead of uh, raising awareness? Expanding. Yeah. Start, I, I, you start I, I, out with very little understanding. You're, we're all conditioned into a physical world. From the uh, I, totally. Totally. And, my, and then you my, start having these experiences where suddenly things don't make sense or they don't, or suddenly you just shift the way you see the world. And it's a gift, as you said, it's past. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, but yeah, I'm just getting back. And, and I'll let you go in a minute. <laughs> but I, there were some other words I picked up. For example, you were talking about goals, which again, to me, is a very masculine word. What about intentions instead? I think intentions are different than goals. Okay. What do, how do you see the difference? Well, I have, I have an intention to uh, aim my heart at the divine, which is what I do every single day. But to do so, I have to have no goal. I can't grasp, I can't grasp that thing that I intend to hold. So I aim right. toward go. Well, that's different than the way I work in the world. In the world, I have to have goals in order to, to like, my goal might be to, I've got to go pick up my lawnmower at the end of the day, and I've got to do all these things before I get, before I can drive out of town to go do this thing. Okay, um, got it. In the very limited time that we've shared together, um, I've scum, I, I have, I have moved very rapidly um, without great depth, but I think that if we were to have deeper conversations, you would find that, uh, that. Uh, there's more to me than there seems to be. 
And to me as well. I'm sure there is. Kathy Mason says I should interview you on our TV show. Yes. Yeah. I'd be happy. Yep. Okay, yep. let's talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Oh, and Janet, by the way, I have no problem with being challenged. I think it's cool because how do, because uh, as a writer, um, that's how I grow. So I love, I love, I love that. Just letting you know. So Sean has a question. Where are you, Sean? Can you unmute yourself or here we go. Whoops. Yeah. Hey, hi. Hey. Hey, what a great talk, Peter. Um, so you said something that really struck me because I've been hearing it a lot. And, it, and as an experiencer, you said that you felt so much smarter there than here. Oh, yeah. And <clears throat> about language and the way you speak as an, I mean, I had to actually go to rehab to learn to speak again. And still, I can't put, you're so eloquent. I can't even adequately describe my experience. I still haven't been able to. So I just wanted to comment on that and, and how great you do describe all these different experiences. Um, so I have a question, uh, which I guess it kind of relates to, to what the last question, when you were on the other side, were you a male? Or no. were you, yeah, you were what? I had no, I had, I had no male appendages. <laughs> and you weren't a female either, right? I had no appendages at all. I had no body. <laughs> I was no thing. And not only was I no thing, there was no filter in order to have gender. Like, like gender is this, seems to be this production of the DNA in your brain. That's why there's so many, it's like asexual and transsexual. And, you know, there's all these different kinds of sexuality that we're only becoming aware of now in the 21st century. They've existed all along. <laughs> They've always been there. Um, but once you die, they don't, they didn't, it didn't come with me. I was, I had no gender uh, as a soul. I was, I was light from light. I was love and beauty, but, but only portion there, a, a smaller portion thereof than the whole unity itself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the divine was genderless. Sorry. Sean. And when you came and back. Yeah. A you. And when you came back, would you say you were even less of a quote unquote male? Remember we talked about this a little bit. I think, I think <laughs> that, I think that um, that's what lots of people thought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was just, you know, my, 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 my gender presentation uh, was questioned by lots of people for a long period of time. Um, I think that I think that my brand new hat, which I love this hat, which was given to me by a, an artist friend of mine in Vermont with its sparkles on it, which, which is, I wear it all day long. Um, you know, I, I wore it into town the other day and I went to the, to the pharmacy and the pharmacist like, oh my God, I love your hat. I love your hat. Where'd you get your hat? Who made your hat? Can I get a hat? Like, oh, it has sparkles. I can't wear sparkles. Um, so uh, I, I'm definitely a guy. I'm a guy, um, but I, I don't know. I, I let my I let my other sides show. What can I say? I let my other sides show because I'd rather just be myself than somebody I'm not or pretend to be. And who I really actually am is a genderless consciousness made of light. Um, and that's a huge part of who I am right now. Beautiful. The biggest even. Does that help, Sean, or no? Yes, perfect. Mahalo Good to see you again. Lee. Nice to see you oh, okay, so there's so many things going on in the in the chat here that I, I do want to share. Um, and then Olivia has has had her hand up for a little while. Um, thank you, Sean. Thank you. Um, okay, so a question is: Has Peter lived on different planets or universes, and why are you on Earth? Why Earth? You got me about that last question. I have no idea, you know, especially in this time and place when I really want to be doing interstellar travel in a spaceship at, at you know, warp speed. Um, but yeah, when I was dead, I saw uh, part of my near-death experience was to see the largeness of the 
this of my soul, the the width and the breadth and the depth uh, and the expansiveness of my soul. But I also could see other lives that I had lived, but from where I was, they were li being lived at the time that I was seeing them. So I had all these other lives that were sort of like um, a, a skinny, tiny little appendages sticking out of my soul, but they were little, 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 little things compared to the huge, huge mass of myself. Yeah. Um, but when I, I got to poke inside of two of them and, and neither of them were in any kind of world that I had all recognized. Oh. Um, and, uh, and now, of course, I can only see this little hazy sort of tiny thing. And the, but then I know I remember that they weren't here. So yes, to the first question, why Earth? I have, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't ask, you know, if I don't, I, I, I wish I had an answer for that. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna know until it's revealed to me. And if it's never revealed to me, I'll be like, okay, Earth. <laughs> well, at least it's fine for now and, and for this expression. And we're glad you're here. So um, Brooke Grove wrote, uh, Peter is a spiritual iconoclast whose light expands at all it touches, whom I am grateful to call a beloved friend and a mentor, and whose grace I lovingly resonate with profoundly. Dash, in knowing the collective mystics co-creation of light can and will ultimately change our beautiful yet fragile world level up humanity the time is now a big heart thank you brooke thanks How brooke beautiful. big heart to you yeah she's got the words too and then there's a gentleman named i, I i'm gonna mess up this name i'm afraid um at adele adele whoa samuel Aquo, spirituality is the awareness of God's love, the true aspect of our primal being. Ah, great. Okay. And now I'm going to put Olivia, ask Olivia to come join us, please. If you, I asked you to unmute and show yourself, please. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. And thank you, Peter. This is such a wonderful conversation. And Noel and Bob. And everyone here, I am, my question is actually more about this idea that you just brought up about your past lives. And what I've been learning is that our lives are going on simultaneously because time is really um, a circle, the way the Mayans taught us and everything, and we go in cycles. And what I found is that environment for me has been very, very powerful in helping me get in touch with the past life, particularly recently when I was in Egypt. And I wondered if you could speak to that in your wonderful mystical, mystical experiences, how much perhaps being around certain um, spiritual sites or sacred sites or stones or whatever, can help us awaken and can help us get in touch with parts of ourselves that maybe have been hidden or can help us unblock something that has been holding us back in this life? So in honor of Sean in Hawaii, and uh, I had two experiences and one was on Kauai and one was on Oahu. And I was on Kauai visiting a distant cousin of mine and dear friend. And we went for this hike and we were walking up this trail up this mountainside, you know, it's lush and beautiful and this, and we're just walking by this tree and it was a very old tree, maybe two or 300 years old. It was huge in circumference. And, and, and my friend David um, was a spiritual person but he wasn't really a mystical person. Uh, and he walked by this tree and I watched him sort of like what and i walked by the tree the same just after him and it was this tree radiated the divine light i mean it was so big and beautiful it was just david walked through its field and he was befuddled by it and and so there's this i think that there are places where the divine energy is powerful mm -hmm. and i was on, on oahu i was being toured to a uh, heiau which is a sacred site from uh hawaiian religion uh pele and you're supposed to 
to pick up a pick up a stone or something in, or leave a little gift and wrap it in a leaf and leave it on this particular rock formation. And I was walking over to it and I was talking to this friend of mine, Hawaiian, and I say, hey, Lucanne, um, I don't have a stone. And as I talked to her, as I said, I don't have a stone, as the words left my mouth, my flip flop picked up a stone, tossed it up in the air. And as my arm swung backwards in a cup, landed right in my palm. Wow. It's like, oh, wait a minute, I do have one. Wow. Um, you know, the, I, I think that those that there are sites, a friend of mine just was in Egypt also, maybe you saw her there. And um, she was in Egypt also. And she said that the power of the place brought her back to her previous selves. Yeah. I, I've never had that experience. I, I have had the experience of seeing that my lives are simultaneous because I was in a place of timelessness where all time exists, not just time moving forward, but time moving in a thousand different directions and, but also completely in the now and timeless. So living lives simultaneously, that's what I saw. Um, but I also, I, I focus a lot less on who I was than who I am. I'm much more interested in putting all of my energy that I can in this life toward the toward my higher self because because I've I'm I know very clearly I am not Peter. I live in this body, uh, but this is not me. And so, as much as I as I extrapolate from that idea that if this is not me, then none of those others are really me either. Then who am I really? I'm really this higher self. I better put all my energy into that thing. And so I've been putting all of my energy, my spiritual life into not not trying to find out who I was, but trying to find out who I am. Um, and I try to live in the in the presence of the divine as much as I possibly can in the here and now, because this is where my physical form is. I have lots of friends who find great help with uh, understanding and learning about their past lives. And I think that's great. That's just not the path that I'm on. And, and I want to also add that I don't have any false idea that I know the whole truth. I know that I only know a portion of the truth. And I know this because I only brought back like a, a, a 0.0001% of what I knew on the other side. And what I knew on the other side was not the totality of all the infinity. So I'm very clear that my knowledge is limited. And um, so when I talk about anything uh, that's spiritual, take it with a grain of salt because everything I know is just a little bit. Uh, that's what. That's why we we run. We, I run this thing called Mystic Tea Salon on Sunday mornings with some of the people who are here tonight attend. And the reason why I run it is because mystical experiences always leave people with deep wisdom, and real mystical experiences leave people with real deep wisdom. And so we need to share that. We need to hear from each other, and we learn from each other. Uh, so I'm a student as as much as I am some kind of teacher, which I don't even know what kind of teacher I am, but I'm definitely a student. That much I'm sure of. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so um, Sally wrote, can you describe what you believe life will be like after death? Will I unite with my mother, brother, and other relatives who have passed after my death? I have attended a lot of death in my life and um, because I was a pastor. And so plenty of times, plenty, plenty, plenty of times people are greeted at death's door by people that have preceded them. And, and they, not only that, they start to talk about it before they die. So you're in the hospital room and, oh my gosh, grandma, what are you doing here? Oh, there's my dog. Um, and in the olden days, when I, first, when I first started working as a pastor, the nurses would say, oh dear, they come up and pat their hand. Oh dear, it's okay. They're not really here. Because I live in Maine, or and, and um, very sweet, but but then people began to understand that no, we they really are here, and so for sure people are greeted by those they love. So then the question is, if reincarnation is real, how can they greet me if they're on to another life? And the answer is that uh, these lives seem to be run simultaneously, and I can be dead and alive at the same time. I'm dead and alive at the moment, at, at this very minute. So will you be reunited? Oh, I think so. I've, I've seen, I've heard enough about it. My dad came to visit me last week, a week ago. Um, my sister, who's been dead now, I don't know how many years, since 2007, she visited my mom three years ago. Um, my grandparents, who've been dead a lot longer, they visited my mom in an after-death, I mean, after-death communication. Uh, love is, is unending. 
Love is the only thing that's unending. And if you cultivate love with a person here, that could, that, that doesn't stop. Yes. Death has no grip on that. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, there's uh, several things here. Um, Noel has asked, what about hell? What about hell? <laughs> I went to hell. I think she's worried <laughs> about it. <laughs> oh, 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 it'll it be hot? fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> it'll be okay. Don't you? It's fine. No, so I went through, I, I, not every near death experience goes through a hell. I went through a hell. Um, maybe that's because I was raised in the Orthodox and Catholic, and Catholic Church. I don't know why I went through hell. All I know is that I went through one and I, was a, I had no agency. I wasn't making choices about this. Nothing that happens in a mystical experience, you're not making any choices or decisions. They, it happens to you. You got no choice. So I, hmm. I went through this hell where I suffered all of the pain that I gave away in my entire life from the inside of the experience of every single person I gave it to and every single second that I had given it to every single body, every single body of all of my life, it's juxtaposed to all of the reasons and rationales and emotions that caused me to cause that pain. And it turned out that all the pain that I gave away to these people was 10,000 times larger than I thought it was, because that's what it felt like when I was inside of them, compared to my reasons, which were teeny, teeny, tiny and foolish. And all of that pain belonged to me. So I suffered all of this pain that I gave away. And it was terrible suffering. Uh, I could call it fire, if you want me to, fire and brimstone. Um, but what it turned out to be was the divine fire of purgative love cleansed me of all my attachments that I couldn't otherwise release in order for me to enter into union. And so as I went through this process, which was temporary, the voice that has no sound was speaking inside of me from outside of me and surrounding me in infinity and right up close and personal. I love you. I know you. I've always known you. You're my beloved. Welcome home. Come home. Come home. Hear my voice. And once the ear of my heart, which was made of love, could begin to focus on the voice of the divine speaking inside me, my hell ended and all of the shackles that I had forged in life to quote Charles Dickens fell away and I was infused and filled with oneness. And so part of the deal I made when I was dead, when I, before I came back was, you know, I, I, as I was talking to God, I knew that I had just gone through this hell experience. And I said, can I come back here to this place of oneness and unity with you to this love that's, that is universal and timeless and expansive and, and God said, yes, or the voice said, yes, or the whatever you want to call it. Atman said, yes, Brahman, said, Allah um, said yes to me. And, and when I got back to earth, my whole life has been lived with the awareness of the suffering that I give to people, the wounds I give to people. And sometimes I can't help but give to them because I have emotional, my own emotional life, because I'm a human being. Um, and I try to minimalize that because I fully expect to go back through what I went through before. Um, and so, but I'm cool with it. That's the thing. I, I, I have this promise that is a universalized promise. It wasn't just for me. What I, what I saw when I was dead was the universal salvation, to put it in Christian language, of all sentient and non-sentient beings. Uh, every, everyone is made of beloved golden light, every single one of us, and none of us is not, even if they can't see it, even if they're blind to it for their whole lives, it doesn't change the origin of themselves. It's already done. It's already established. It's not something that, that and so really all, all this was for me and, and for the few other near-death experiencers I've know who went through hell and came out um, into the divine light is that it was temporary. It was a temporary cleansing that once you turned to the light, to the love, it ended. I know other near-death experiencers who didn't, who, whose experience didn't end in light. It ended in hell, but maybe they weren't dead long enough. Mm. And, and maybe if they stayed dead longer, that would have changed. But the result is, with those people, is that they live their lives differently, uh, just like all near-death experiencers. And it seems like some NDEers go to hell and some don't, uh, but, but most of us who go far enough all go into the light. We all go into the light, every one of us. Yes. Beauty, light, joy, bliss, paradise, adoration, hope, knowledge. So I don't know what's going to happen to you, but I know that I'm, if I... 
what game over game over ding ding try again <laughs> yeah yeah well that too <laughs> well i apologize um i i'm afraid we're out of time because certainly um that we could go on and on and on and thank you you're so eloquent when you said my heart had ears oh oh, oh yeah oh oh my gosh That's and the more so you cultivate beautiful. silence the better your hearing becomes so mm. beautiful well thank you all for coming and i hope i've been putting um links to peter's web page in the chat and hopefully it's on facebook too peter would you like to sum up anything um just to finish up how people can get a hold of you and how um how they can uh, learn more for themselves so that they can um expand their their horizons please sure i'm, I'm at peterpanagor.love and that is um all my links are there i'm um, sunday morning we do a live stream called not church no dogma no doctrine no bravo sierra because youtube won't let me say is this on youtube right now i won't say it um, no. <laughs> <laughs> bravo no bravo sierra and uh and mysticism it's and so i uh, and we have so i, I present a, a a talk which i have no idea what to call yet and then we have a conversation because it's live chat and then we shift over to zoom where we have uh, somewhere close to 50 people now on a weekly basis uh, coming with their mystical experiences, talking wisdom talk in humility. Humility is the operative word there. And so, and I'm available for counseling. I do a lot of single sessions so to for people who are primarily for people who are trying to figure out their mystical experiences or, or near-death experiences mostly. Um, um, so those, all those things and, and writing, still writing for the movie and as soon as that's over, God help me in the next couple of months, uh, uh, my part of it will be done. And then I'll be back to the book again. Yay. I can't wait. And thank you so much. Uh, we, we just love um, this experience and you are such a gift. Thank well, you thanks, so Kevin. much, Peter. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I'm thank on, you, yeah. Peter. Thank you. Go ahead. You're welcome. Go ahead. I was going to say I'm on Facebook too. Yeah. <laughs> um, wonderful. And we've been getting a lot of comments through the Facebook chat as well. Uh, so thank you, Peter, so much. And uh, it's just a, a joy to have you here, to hear you speak and, uh, uh, you know, what you've, all the people that you've inspired and uh, your mentors and mentees that are here with you, that's also inspiring for us to bring that to our group. We feel very honored uh, by all of your presence and our collective presence together that's co-created this beautiful evening. Absolutely.